This is K. Sri Damananda, in case you were wondering. Okay. Tonight is the greater series of questions and answers, Sutta number 43. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jettis Grove, Anath and Pindika's Park. Then when it was evening, the Venerable Mahakohita rose from meditation, went to the Venerable Sariputta, and exchanged greetings with him. He actually went with a bunch of students. He was any any time you hear in front of a monk's name in the suttas, Maha, that means that they were very special. There was eighty monks that had that were given the Maha and that was that was all. And all of them were arahats. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said to the venerable Sariputta, one who is unwise, one who is unwise is said, friend, with reference to what is this said, one who is unwise. One does not wisely understand. One does not wisely understand, friend. That's why it is said, one who is unwise. And what doesn't one wisely understand? One does not wisely understand this is suffering. Now, what he's actually talking about here is dependent origination and each of the links that have the four uh, noble truths in them. One does not wisely understand this is the origin of suffering. One does not wisely understand this is the cessation of suffering. One does not wisely understand this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. One does not wisely understand. One does not wisely understand, friend. That's why it is said one who is unwise. Saying, good friend, the Venerable Mahakohita delighted and rejoiced in the Venerable Sariputta's words. Then he asked a further question. One who, is un, one who is wise, one who is wise is said, friend, with reference to what was this said, one who is wise. One wisely understands, one wisely understands, friend, that's why it is said, one who is wise. What does one wisely understand? One wisely understands this is suffering. One wisely understands this is the origin of suffering. One wisely understands this is the cessation of suffering. One wisely understands this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. One wisely understands, one wisely understands, friend. That is why it is said one who is wise. Consciousness, consciousness is said, friend, with reference to what is consciousness said. It cognizes, it cognizes. Now when we're talking about 
this word cognize, we generally use the word recognize. And recognize means you recognize. You do it again. You cognize again. When it says just cognize, it means that you're seeing something for the first time and you're very closely aware of it. That's why consciousness is said. What does it cognize? It cognizes this is pleasant. It cognizes this is painful. It cognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. So what we're talking about here is feeling with perception. Okay? Perception is, an, is the part of the mind that names that kind of feeling that came up, whether it's painful or pleasant or neither painful nor pleasant. Cognition is the awareness of what arises, but perception is the name that, or is the, the part of the mind that puts a name to it. It also has memory in it. That is why consciousness is said. Wisdom and consciousness, friend, are these states conjoined or disjoined? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them? Wisdom and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. Listen very closely now. For what one wisely understands, that one cognizes. And what one cognizes, that one wisely understands. Again, we're talking about the links of dependent origination and how that process works. <clears throat> that is why these states are conjoined, not disjoined. And it's impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. So here's the typical question that would be asked in Asia when you make that kind of a statement. What is the difference <laughs> between wisdom and consciousness, these states that are conjoined, not disjoined, the difference, friend, between wisdom and consciousness, these states that are conjoined, not disjoined, is this. Now listen closely again. Wisdom is to be developed, seeing the links of dependent origination, and consciousness is to be fully understood. Okay, you want to hear it again? Okay, wisdom is to be developed and consciousness is to be fully understood. So that means seeing how these links actually occur with a very clear, bright mind. Okay. Feeling, feeling is said, friend, with reference to what is feeling said. It feels, it feels, friend. Now, one of the things that happens in this book is when you get to the Satipatthana Sutta, it doesn't say feeling, it says feelings. 
implying that it's emotional feelings, not actual feeling. What does it feel? It feels pleasure, it feels pain, it feels neither pain nor pleasure. It feels, it feels, friend, that's why feeling is said. Perception. Perception is said, friend, with reference to what was perception said. It perceives, it perceives. Friend, that's why perception is said. What does it perceive? Now it's going to go into colors. And that's, that means putting a name on this color or that color. Perception is the very beginning of our conceptual thinking. We only think in concepts. Okay, this is a chair. Where is the chair? Is it the arms? Is it the legs? Is it the back? Is it the seat? Where is the concept chair? This is made up of a lot of different little things put together to make up the concept of a chair. And this is something that we recognize. You look at this, and then this is a book. But where is the book? Is it the cover? Is it the page? Is it the print? Where is book? Now you can also do it in, a, in another way. Where is an automobile? Is it the wheels? Is it the bumper? Is it the motor? Motor is a big concept. There's a lot of little pieces in that to make up that concept. Is it the windscreen? Is it the steering wheel? Where is the automobile? It's all of these different things, these concepts put together to make up the concept of automobile, okay? So that's what we're talking about with perceiving. It perceives blue, it perceives yellow, it perceives red, it perceives white. It perceives, it perceives, friend. That is why perception is said. And that is why feeling and perception are always conjoined. Because if you didn't have the perception, it would just be a feeling that arises, but you wouldn't be able to know what kind of feeling it was. So Benedict, when someone is blind and they, they see a car or the face, don't have perception? They still have a feeling or they just if don't? They, if they can't see it, how could they have a perception of it unless they felt it? So if someone was born blind, would he say? <laughs> what did I just say? How could they perceive it unless they felt it? How can they perceive a chair? Doesn't matter whether they're blind or not, right? They still know it's a chair, but it, where is the chair? Okay? Feeling, perception, and consciousness, friend. Are these states conjoined or disjoined? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. Feeling, perception, and consciousness, friend. <coughs> these states are conjoined, not disjoined. 
and it's impossible to separate each state each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. Listen closely for what one feels that one perceives. What one perceives that one cognizes. Okay, so these three are conjoined. Uh, interesting little phenomena. Think about the five aggregates. You have body, you have feeling, you have perception, you have consciousness, and you have formations. So these five aggregates are actually three aggregates because these are always together. And in some ways, when you look at something, you start to recognize that's true, but also you have aggregates with different meanings. The I can't think of a, an example to give to you tonight. We'll have to let that one go, it's not coming. See what I mean? I have a, a deep mind, but it's not very fast. <laughs> For what one feels, that one perceives. And what one perceives, that one cognizes. That is why these states are conjoined, not disjoined, and it is impossible to separate each of these states from the others in order to describe the difference between them. Now, think about this part very deeply. Friend, what can be known by purified mind consciousness released from the five aggregates. Where are the five aggregates? Five aggregates are in your head. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body. Okay. So that means, oh, let me, let me read on. Friend, by purified mind consciousness released from the five aggregates the base of infinite space can be known thus space is infinite now when i tell you you don't have a body i literally mean it you're in a mental realm don't tell me about what sensations you feel in your body because that's not real. What's real is that that is mental. The base of, uh, can be known thus, okay. The base of infinite consciousness can be known thus. Consciousness is infinite. The base of nothingness can be known thus. There is nothing. Friend, with what does one understand a state that can be known? Friend, one understands a state that can be known with the eye of wisdom, with your attention, with your mindfulness. This is the eye of wisdom. You're seeing that this is part of an impersonal process. To be quite honest, you don't even have a head. Not really. So where's consciousness? I don't know. 
that's the <clears throat> interesting uh, argument where is consciousness it's not any place it just is why is it because of past actions that's why we're here it is karmic but where is consciousness Consciousness arises because the conditions are right for it to arise. Now, when you have a lot of hindrances and your mind is really active and jumping all around, that comes from past action. That was unwholesome that you broke a precept and you took it personally, that's why hindrances arise. What you do with what arises in the present, not present moment, in the present, dictates what happens in the future. One of the things that has become real popular here in America is to talk about the present moment. Have you ever tried to truly see the present moment? By the time you see it, it's gone. There's another moment. So to be accurate, you don't say present moment, you just say the present. That slows things down so you can actually see them. <clears throat> Friend, what is the purpose of wisdom? The purpose of wisdom, friend, is direct knowledge. Its purpose is full understanding. Its purpose is abandoning. Okay, so what are we talking about here? The purpose of abandoning. Abandoning what? Abandoning the false belief in a personal self. This is, this is who I am. I am here. That's a false belief. But we have to use I. I got scolded by somebody because I kept on saying I and me and mine. But it's just convention. Well, you're attached. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> so, The purpose of wisdom is full understanding. Understanding of what? Understanding how this process works. That's the purpose of wisdom. And with direct knowledge. So having direct knowledge how this process works, how can you have an I or a me or a mine? It's just a process. But we have many uh, millions of lifetimes of thinking that we are all this is me, this is my body, this is what I do. I do good deeds and I do bad deeds. And I'm identifying with all of those. That's why you keep coming back. Now you're starting to get more and more a, an understanding of the importance of right effort. Don't Keep your attention on something. Don't make a big deal of something. 
well, I had some purple color arising. So, 6R, it's nothing. It doesn't matter what it is that arises. What matters is what you do with what arises. And the more you let go of craving and practice right effort, you start seeing more and more clearly that this is just a process. It's all concepts. But we take these concepts personally and we cause ourselves huge amounts of pain. I've been, I've been talking to quite a few people today and yesterday and the day before about forgiveness. What do you think the purpose of forgiveness is? Forgiveness is learning how to let go of that false belief in a past action, that false belief in a personal self. We cause ourselves huge amounts of pain. Now, when you're successful with forgiveness, what does that mean? It means you've learned to stop identifying with the pain from past actions, from taking things personally. And that's why you feel huge relief when you finally realize, well, it's only that. It's not that big a deal. See, anything you make a big deal of, guess who is there? And guess who is taking it personally? And guess who is causing themselves immeasurable amounts of pain and suffering? And when you finally let go of that pain and suffering, what happens in your mind? All of a sudden, your mind is clear. Your mind is bright. Your mind is very observant. And then you go back to your meditation object, whatever that happens to be, and it's real easy to stay with that without having a lot of distractions. So again, please stop making a big deal out of everything. Stop taking on that pain that you're causing yourself. One of the real reasons that I love Buddhism is the self-responsibility. You can't blame somebody else for your pain because it's yours and you're doing it to yourself. It's real easy to point at somebody and say, you made me mad. They didn't make you mad. You made yourself mad. And you took it personally and you put it and wrap it around your heart. And then you become hard-hearted. And then you have to do some more forgiveness to let go of that false belief in a personal self. So when I was in India, I was really amazed at how many people I had to show forgiveness. They started doing loving kindness, but a lot of them, they didn't have any feeling. What does that mean? It means their heart is wrapped around with a lot of false belief in a personal self, a lot of hard-heartedness. Everything about Buddhism is opening up and allowing, not taking it personally. It's seeing the way it actually is. Now, after you forgive and you go do whatever you do, a memory might come up of that situation, but there's no more pain in it. 
So now you can see it as it actually is. It's just a feeling. It's just a thought. It's just a memory. Why am I making a big deal out of it? Why am I causing myself so much pain? After a few days of doing forgiveness for the people that I was teaching in India, there was one retreat I gave, there was 11 different countries represented. So people were coming from all over, all over the world. There was Japanese, there was Koreans. There was some, uh, quite a few Indians, but people from Europe, four or five different countries in Europe. Somebody even came from America. Amazing. It's a long ways to go to do a retreat. That's all I can think. <laughs> Not to be thick-headed about this, but you know, the forgiveness, the thing about it is I'm not exactly clear how it helps you to see. Um, you have to convince yourself that you made a mistake and it's okay. You have to convince yourself. That's what you repeat it over and over again enough. You will, you will go, oh, it's not that big a deal. <laughs> and then that helps you see it's impersonal? Because it's of course. Like I'm saying, I forgive me for something I, forgive. I did. Right? But that's a past action, isn't it? Yeah. That's a hindrance, isn't it? Yes. It's something you're taking personally, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. Okay. When you get to the forgiveness and you get to where you stop taking it so personally, where you truly forgive yourself, then you'll feel relief. And it really is. That's why some people it takes longer than others because they, they think something that they did really was big. And we've all made mistakes. And it's okay to make mistakes. That's the thing that we have to start understanding. If you don't make mistakes, you're not going to learn. But the trick is, don't do it over and over again, okay? Because then you start developing that guilty feeling. And that guilty feeling causes you to take it personally. This is a form of loving kindness. But it's loving kindness to yourself. Now, you, you're, you're hearing me say over and over again, you be kind to yourself. You be gentle to yourself. You have fun. Okay, we make mistakes. Forgive yourself for making a mistake right then. Take the precepts again. Determination, don't do that again. Now you're not going to be walking around with a guilty feeling. I had some people that uh, were soldiers and they were in Afghanistan and they had to do some really nasty things and caused suffering. And they took that very personally. And it was, that's what PTSD is all about, is breaking that precept and taking it personally and then when you try to sleep it was such a horrific thing that you did it will come back at you over and over again it takes a while to overcome ptsd but it's not impossible uh there was there was one man that he had to do two retreats of nothing but forgiving himself. 
But when he let go of that guilty feeling of doing whatever he did, I don't really care what it was. It's important, more important for him than it is for me to know. When I got, he got to this place where he truly forgave himself because he didn't understand. He didn't understand all of the stuff that was pushed on him that he took and he was taking things personally. And when he let go, he walked into the room I didn't recognize him. He was a different person. Absolutely beautiful. Great stuff. It really is. Sometimes it takes a while before you can let go. I, I've had a, I had a woman that was raped. She was terribly violated. And she had a me immeasurable hatred towards the person that did it. That's only natural. Yeah, okay. She had to work for... for I want to say 10 months, but it might not have been quite that long, say nine months. And she finally forgave that person for that act of violation. She forgave the act. If she saw that person walking down the street, she's not going to walk up to him and give him a hug. She's going to stay away from him but she didn't have that extreme pain. And I see personality change that's just remarkable. And change of their whole life. It's, it's nice to see somebody work that hard to let go of that. And they went on to, to have good, happy lives without having that memory come back at them and make that fear come up again because of a violation of one, one sort or another. And it's the same with PTSD. Forgive yourself, you made a mistake. Okay. Keep forgiving yourself till you really convince yourself that you do forgive that. You didn't want to do it. You didn't want that to happen to you. You acted or reacted in a way that wasn't entirely appropriate. One way or another, I'm thinking of PTSD, not the rape. They didn't have much to do with that. They were just walking down the street. So, the, the soldier that, I mean, he really went through it. He went through a lot of tears. He went through a lot of anguish. He went through a lot of identification with, I did that, and I feel really bad. But after the second retreat, he was amazing. He was happy. And that's the first time in a few years that he even approached the idea of having any joy in life. We beat ourselves up a lot because we make mistakes. And sometimes we make them over and over again. But that doesn't mean there can't be a cure for it. 
It really does work. Well, okay, it sounds like forgiveness and harmonious imaging are related. Uh, very much. Can you, is, it, is it that simple, or can you talk more about that? <laughs> <laughs> it's that simple. It's that simple. <laughs> It's not easy, but it is that simple. And we don't like things that are simple, and we do like beating ourselves up and causing ourselves all kinds of misunderstandings and problems and pain. But when, when you get into the forgiveness, and you start to see how amazing it is when you get into it, you're going to start having more and more room in your heart for love. It's really important. The thing with the, the way that people are practicing forgiveness right now, it's kind of, oh, I forgive myself for doing that and then go off and do whatever you do. But you don't really forgive yourself. You gotta work at it. I did it for two years. I understand it. Sometimes I think something should be different. Should I forgive that too? Of course. Are you are you taking it personally that you're there? Guess what? Yeah. And when you walk into a room and somebody comes at you with their anger or dissatisfaction, what are you going to do? You're going to take their anger and dissatisfaction and throw it back at them because you don't like the feeling you get from that person? Or are you going to have compassion? Again, compassion is seeing another person suffering. Allow them to suffer. Don't try to talk them out of it. But love them without any conditions. Just radiate loving kindness. You're radiating, really, compassion. And it doesn't take very long before there is a change of behavior in the person that's angry. One of two things actually happen. They will start to change and then you can start discussing or they will feel so uncomfortable that they'll leave. I'll tell you another story. I'm full of stories, I guess. I lived in San Francisco for a lot of years, and I went to a party. And people were smoking pot, and people were drinking alcohol, and I really wasn't very comfortable being at that party. I just knew one person, and they, I got invited that way. And I thought, you know, I really don't feel like talking to any of these people because their, their minds are really bizarre. So I started radiating loving kindness. Oh, that sounded like a good thing to do. And people in ones and twos got up out of the room and went into another room. <laughs> and before long, I'm sitting in the room alone, <laughs> and I'm radiating loving kindness. And I thought, well, I might as well leave. Nobody wants to talk to me. <laughs> but as it happened, there were some people, some couples there that the, the wife or mate, whatever they were, they weren't partaking in, in the pot or the alcohol. And they came back in the room, and there was three or four of them, and we had a great conversation. 
it was like all of a sudden we were real close friends. And I found that to be interesting. And there's some people that they feel so uncomfortable about loving kindness, they just don't want to be around it because they know how sloppy they are. They know what their mind is doing and they kind of feel guilty. They want to be away from happy feelings. So it's really more and more interesting how life can be so much fun without anger, without causing myself problems. And I still make mistakes. Oops. Okay, I forgive myself right then. But if some one of say uh, your mate comes into the room and they're emotional, they've had a bad day, they they are angry at everything and they want to give it to you, you don't have to accept it. You can start forgiving them right then. And I've seen absolute miracles happen by doing this. I've seen people that were really, really angry and I've, I've, at the meditation center, that does happen sometimes. People don't get along. And they say, let's go talk to Bhante. So, oh, good, thanks. <laughs> so what do I do? Am I going to get in the middle of their argument? I'm not that dumb. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to radiate loving kindness. And I've seen it happen dozens of times. They're both talking at the same time. They're, they've raised their voice. They're almost coming to blows. But I just sit there and radiate loving kindness and not really pay attention to what they're saying because it's emotional nonsense anyway. And before long, I mean, within two or three minutes, they start talking to each other and they start dis discussing what they thought the problem was and they found out they didn't really have a problem. It was just emotional upset. And I just sit there, I don't say anything. After a few more minutes, they agree with each other and they have an understanding that what you said I didn't, you didn't really mean, what I said I didn't really mean, so let's just let that go. And I'm sitting there radiating loving kindness and then they start laughing. They, they actually are, they've forgiven each other and they start to get along and they, they start having fun. And then they say, I gotta go back to work, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, whatever it is. Thanks, Bhante. <laughs> and I don't see them anymore. And I didn't say anything. So this is part of the purpose of wisdom. Seeing the impersonal nature not only of you, but of other people. And when they are caught by emotional upset, then you don't get involved with it. You don't take sides with anybody. They, they come to me because they know 
that I'm not going to take sides. I'm not even going to pay attention to what they're talking about. I'm just going to focus on loving kindness. And they know that I will give them what they want most. To be loved. Everybody wants that. Yeah? Have you found that your students tend to actually acquire that ability so that it's sort of... Of course. Yeah. Why do I think that, why do I say things like, do you want to affect the world around you in a positive way? What do you think I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Why? That's your problem. You're judging, you're judging, you're taking it personally, and you're practicing pity. And pity always causes more problems than it's worth. So you let go of that. You develop your equanimity so it doesn't matter. Okay, they come in the room and they're arguing. I'm not going to make a judgment one way or the other. I'm just going to start loving them. Okay? You have, you in particular have a tendency to try, try to take other people's pain away. And that causes you to be unhappy. Pity doesn't work. If you go to a doctor and he really doesn't like to give a shot, and he's going to give you a shot, and right before he does it, he goes, <laughs> I don't want that shot. I don't care how good that shot is for me. Because he's doing it out of pity. And there's no healing in that. There's healing and compassion. There's healing and acceptance. Not, no judgments. You don't need to be judging uh, good or bad. Sure, there's good and bad. There's times that are hard and times that aren't so hard, but you can always develop the equanimity so it's not such rigid uh, experience. Just love them. That's a thing that everybody wants. Sometimes I can be in, in an area that's not my home, but I'll see people that are starting to argue. I, I can be across the street. It doesn't matter. I can start sending loving kindness to them. And I watch it happen lots how people stop doing that, how they start discussing what the problem is, letting go of their anger, their dissatisfaction, and then they get to be friends. So it's pretty amazing. But the, part, the thing is you have to remember to do it. Don't get caught up in the emotional upset. A couple nights ago, I was talking about nurses that were taking care of children that have cancer. Now, a lot of times they can only do that for so long and then they have to go to another, take, a, take on another job. They can't stand to be with somebody that's suffering so much. You can't take their suffering away, but you can love them. And you can have fun with them, not pity them. The more you radiate loving kindness into a situation, it always turns out better. It works. I wouldn't tell you about it if it didn't. And I, I, sometimes I have students that try to yes but me, and they want to argue with me about, yeah, but they did this, and, and I don't care. I really don't. 
All I see is that you're suffering, but I can't take your pain away, but I can certainly love you. That's how you affect the world around you in a, in a positive way. Swanson, does your level of cultivation make a difference? I mean, you, you being a great mom would radiate love to someone would make a huge difference versus me radiating or it's just... Why do you think it would be any different? I, I wasn't sure, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> I've had more practice than you have, that's all. But it's not my love. It's just focusing on love and let love go where it needs to go. When I was visiting people in hospitals, they were in extreme pain, a lot of them. <coughs> they were getting close to death. What good does my feeling sorry for them do them? What does it do for me? It makes me suffer. And if I'm going to suffer, I'm going to start to feel helpless. Oh, you poor dear, I'm sorry. I got to go. <laughs> but I don't do that. I walk in the room. Yeah, they, they can be moaning and groaning. They can be in real serious pain. But after a few minutes of loving them, then they start to change. Their, their level of consciousness starts to come up to my level. And I'm happy. Well, how can you be happy when somebody's dying? Why not? Is that going to help them to be sorry for them? It doesn't work. There was a man that had a, he had a tumor right here. It was on the carotid artery. And it was a major surgery that he had to have. So the night before he went in for surgery, I got he and his family together and I started teaching them loving kindness and I talked very much about you are never helpless, ever. There's always something you can do to help. Practice your generosity. So I took the man that was going to have the operation. I put him in the middle and his family all around him in a circle and we all radiated loving kindness to him. And his mind became very peaceful and accepting. And then I took each one of the other family members and I put them in the middle of the circle and we all radiated loving kindness to them. And they liked that. They really thought that day, this is good, this is fun. And I can do that any time. You don't ever have to indulge in pain, even though it's there. The interesting thing with this particular man, uh, he went into the hospital, they started operating on them, on him, and they said it was going to take uh, between seven and eight hours. No, it was six and seven hours, excuse me. So what was I doing all day? I knew he was in the hospital. I'm radiating loving kindness to him. I'm radiating loving kindness to the doctor. I'm radiating loving kindness to the nurses. And I radiated loving kindness to the family. I did it all day. I was just walking back and forth, radiating loving kindness. And acceptance of whatever happened. I mean, this was a serious operation. And I didn't hear anything from the family. And I thought, well, this is kind of odd. 
but okay, maybe it just took a little bit longer. Uh, after 10 hours, one of the family members called me up and said, he's still in surgery. It wound up taking 13 hours. And one of the reasons it took so long was because of the loving kindness I was sending to the doctor, so he was particularly careful. He wasn't, I wasn't able to see him after he got out because they put him on, they, they just shut his whole body down. They put him on total life or, or life, uh, whatever you call it. So the day after that, they put him in a hospital room. Now the hospital room was a little bit bigger than this room and there were beds one right beside the other. That's the way it is in, in Asia and in some hospitals. So the family came and they picked me up and I'm going into the in to see him. And one of his relatives really started to get into her pity and she had so much fear and anxiety and that sort of thing. I actually told her to go visit somebody else. <laughs> and I, I, I pulled up a chair and I sat beside this man and I held his hand and I just radiated loving kindness. Now he was really weak. After about an hour he started getting a little fidgety and he started moving a little bit and I, I changed the bed so that he was sitting straighter. And after about two hours, I was seeing him get stronger. And after a couple hours, I thought, okay, he's getting stronger, he'll do fine. So I turned around ready to go away and the guy in the bed next to me said, can you hold my hand? <laughs> he was a Muslim. The Muslims in Malaysia do not particularly like Buddhist monks, but he asked if I would help him. Well, of course. It took me almost four hours to get out of the hospital because <laughs> I'd get done with one and then another one would sit there, can you hold my hand? They all felt that love and acceptance, no judging, no fear, no anxiety, The man got out of the hospital about three days later, which was pretty remarkable. He was a school teacher, and the operation was such that he could only whisper. So I went to see him when he was home, and I told him, can you go outside and walk? Yeah, I can I can walk and I'm strong enough to do that. So I had him doing the walking meditation while he was radiating loving kindness. And I said, just a half an hour, that's enough. And he did it, I think, three times a day. But he kept on getting stronger. He was really feeling good, but he couldn't <laughs> talk. And he thought, oh, I'm not going to be able to teach anymore. And he truly loved to teach. And I, I think it was the fourth day, he called me up on the phone and his voice was regular. I said, what happened? He said, I was wishing all beings happiness and then I started wishing my family happiness and I had to spit. And he spit up this big glob of stuff that was on his his vocal cords, and then now he could speak again. But I didn't do it. 
it wasn't me. It was focusing on loving kindness. Being patient with it. Yeah. And so, it, obviously, if you have to do this to 100 people and all you can spend is five minutes doing loving kindness to 100 people, would that I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. I would just radiate to all of them at the same time. So the time wise, the longer you do, the more effective it is than doing positive. I don't know. Sometimes it works fast, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know. I'm not in control. All I'm doing is focusing on it. It can go where it wants to go and do what it wants to do. Yeah. Intuition. You'll, you'll just feel like, yeah, okay, everything is doing good. And because of that, I started going to the hospital every day because people were talking about me like I'm something special, and I'm not. I'm just a regular guy that loves people. That's it. You have to remember to do it. That's the key. Don't get caught in your sadness. Don't get caught in your anxiety and fear and whatever. I mean, he could have died. But why? what good would it do me to worry about that? How can I help somebody else if I'm worrying? So pretty good question, isn't it? Yeah. And when you radiate loving kindness to a particular person, you have to have an image of them in your head or they're sitting right in front of me. Well, but that doesn't know. matter. I was also teaching loving kindness every night and we had a healing group where there was ten or twelve people that would come once a week and they would come with a photograph of somebody that was really sick. So we'd pass the photograph around and put it in the middle and then just start radiating loving kindness. It's amazing what can happen. And it's kind of fun. Yeah. What do I care what they think? I'm happy in myself. If they want to join me in the happiness, that's great. If they don't, okay. See, I don't judge them. They can be the way they want to be. That's part of compassion. If I take it personally, I'm going to make myself sad. So what's the fun in that? I have a lot of people that throw disrespect at me because I disappoint them because I'm not doing the same things that they're doing. And that's fine. They can, they can be like that if they want. What are they doing to their mind? with the kind of judgments and the bad thoughts and how much are they breaking precepts because they're doing that. So I try to let people do and be the way they want to be. I still get caught sometimes. But I don't beat myself up so much anymore. Yeah. What else what else can I do? The main thing is you don't care what they think. I don't. 
it doesn't matter to you at all, so that should make you feel a lot better. Well, but the, be careful of your judging. That's gonna that's gonna make you sad. Don't do that to me. <laughs> I don't like pedestals, you know. If I get a, if I get put on a pedestal, quite often I jump down from it. I don't want to be on a pedestal. It hurts if you get if you fall off. <laughs> it's not worth it. And like I said last night, I truly don't care about being popular. I don't care about being famous. It's not me that I want people to focus on. I want them to focus on the loving kindness so they can be that way if they want. It's okay. Some people, they like more attention than others. I'm not one of those people that wants a lot of attention. I, I'm almost getting too much when I'm in uh, some of the Asian countries because I'll be walking down the street and people will come up to me and say, I know you, I saw you on, on the internet. I say, oh, good, thanks. And I try to go away. If you're too famous, you have an awful lot of people coming at you. And I don't particularly enjoy that. And I don't want to be put on a pedestal. I freely give to you because I love you. All of you. If I didn't, I wouldn't be here. If I can be an example for you to be happy, that's my job. Great. And I see your face is starting to light up now. Some of you have told you that. Your face is really getting beautiful. You're losing tensions and tightness in your face and you some I I had a lady that she was I think she was seventy eight. She had the deepest wrinkles in her face that was just unbelievable. I had her doing some forgiveness and she let go of some stuff and all of a sudden she didn't have wrinkles in her face anymore. She, she lost 10 years at least off her face. <coughs> That's what I live for. To see that. To see your face glow and to see that I know that it's coming from your mind. And there's an effect of doing this. So I see how successful you are by doing the meditation. I don't know of a job that's better than this. Really. I don't have to think or worry about anything. I have food. I have a place to stay. I have clothes, even though they're a little weird. <laughs> I have medicine. Oh, I, I, I learned a long time ago, especially if I'm in Asia, I never tell anybody I've, I've got a cold coming on because then I get a box full of, of medicines. Take this. This works all the time. Every, this really works good. So I wind up giving most of that medicine away because I like to, to heal naturally as much as I can. So I, I, I travel with vitamin D3, vitamin C, uh, some other vitamins, 
and some minerals. And I know the way to heal my body the fastest. And that is when you start feeling achy and you start feeling like a cold is coming on. Stop what you're doing. Go lay down. Take some vitamins. Sleep if you're going to sleep. Uh, the longest I've had a cold in the last four or five years is eight hours. And you know how much I'm traveling. I don't get I don't get colds, not very often. And when I do, I take rest because that's what your body is really telling you it needs. It needs to be comfortable. And that doesn't mean I lay down and I read a book or I listen to music or I uh, watch something on the on uh, uh, some kind of device or other. No, I just lay down and rest, and I radiate loving kindness to myself. That works. It's not a maybe. The purpose of wisdom is full understanding. Understand how to be in harmony with yourself. That's why I changed the words in the Eightfold Path. It makes more sense that you be in harmony with yourself. If you're truly in harmony with yourself, everybody around you will like you. It's true. The purpose of wisdom is abandoning. Oh, using the six R's. Letting go of the craving. That's the purpose of wisdom. Dependent origination is conditional. Everything in life has conditions in it. What we need to do is learn how to let go of those conditions by letting go of craving. And then you can experience the unconditional. It's not something you can talk about. Why? Because it's conditional ideas that you're trying to get across. I've been with a lot of monks that they want to debate about what is Nibbana. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to get in that talk. It's, it's how can you describe something that doesn't have any conditions? when we're in a world that is only conditional. But some monks, they like, they really like to get into that sort of thing and see if they can learn something from it. But the way you learn is by doing, not by reading, not by philosophizing, not by anything that pulls your mind away from happiness, mindfulness, collectedness. See, one of the things I'm trying to teach you in this retreat is that this is not a some once in a while sitting meditation. This is an all the time practice. You're walking down the street and a bee bites you or stings you, whatever. What do you do with your mind with that? 
Well, you know that bee is going to die because a stinger is in you. Why don't you send some loving kindness to the place that causes that the pain is and to that being that's going to die? Why get angry with that sort of thing? Why run away? I was in Thailand and I went to this one monastery and they didn't particularly like Westerners. So they gave me a cabin that was quite a long ways away and right beside the cabin there was a wasp nest. And these kind of wasps are really mean and they really do cause a lot of swelling and it, they can even kill you if there's enough of them. So they thought that was that was going to be kind of a funny thing so they'd see me running and swinging my hands around trying to get a wasp off of me. So I, okay, fine. So I started radiating loving kindness to the wasps. Now I had to get out every morning, go for an alms round, come back, go to the place where I could take a shower or take a bath or whatever you want to call it, get, get clean, and then come back. I mean, I, I was going in and out fairly often. And I never got stung. I'd go out in the morning and they would come down and zzz, and they're there and i say, hey, how are you doing this morning? And radiate some loving kindness to them. The other monks would come to visit me and they couldn't get to my cabin because they would get stung. And I never got stung, ever. It was really kind, kind of unusual, but it makes sense. Every being wants the same thing. Everybody wants to be loved. So give it to them. That's practicing your generosity. It's an all the time practice. You don't just let your mind go off on tangents and think about this and think about that and worry about this. Why? Why don't you ra radiate some equanimity, radiate some loving kindness to yourself, radiate loving kindness to whoever you're with. Develop the habit of doing it. And I guarantee your life is going to be a lot more fun. So, what to do? It's your choice. Now there's going to be some people leaving. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what to do when you get home. It's your choice what you do when you get home. I do recommend that it's a good idea to sit at least an hour a day but you should never ask me how long you should sit. Don't ever do that. Because I'll tell you, well, six hours a day is a good day. <laughs> For me, what I do is I, I like to get up around two o'clock in the morning lately, and I don't know where that's coming from. But I'll sit till, oh, maybe six o'clock, maybe seven o'clock, whatever. Sitting is good, it's interesting. My mind is reasonably quiet. I have a lot of uh, happiness by sitting. I like to sit. It's fun to sit. So I do that. But there's some times that I might only sit for one hour. Okay. Or I might sit for two hours. I have the time to do it. That's the advantage of being a monk. I have time. I don't have to go to work and worry about money. I don't think about money. 
It's not so important. If you take care of Dhamma, Dhamma takes care of you. It's really true. I even proved that to myself before I became a monk. I spent all my time helping other people. I help, I help with hospice. I help with people in the hospital. I help with whoever needed help. There was one day that I noticed that our uh, one of the neighbors from my mother around my mother's house they'd let the grass grow real high. So I asked my mom, why is she doing that? She said, well, she's in the middle of a divorce and she's really uh, an emotional wreck. So I said, okay. So I went into the garage, I got a lawnmower and I motored on. And she, she came out, she said, why did you do that? I, w I need to pay you. I said, no, you, I don't want any money. Well, why did you do that? I did that to help you. I did that so that your mind could be happy. Then I cleaned stuff up, put, put away the lawnmower and did something else. She needed to have somebody know that she, that she was cared for. And right after that, she started to get happy on her own, so doing things to help. And it was fun. I enjoyed cutting her lawn. The more you start becoming aware of other people and their suffering and don't feel sad because of it, but help them by doing something that will make their mind uplifted and happy. That's what life is for. It's not earning money. I gave a talk one time in, in Malaysia and I, I said, I asked them a question. I said, what's more important, time or money? Oh, money is a lot more important, Chinese. They're like that. And I said, really? I said, well, let's go to the hospital and ask somebody that's dying, which is more important, time or money? Time is much more valuable than money and use your time well so that you help other people say things that make them smile. Do things that help them to overcome their suffering and radiate loving kindness while you're doing it. The only big store, well, there's, now there's a few that are starting to come into this town, but we do most of our shopping at Walmart. That's, the, that's where we can get our supplies. And quite often I will see some short lady looking up at something on the top shelf and there's no way they can, re they can reach it. So I, here, that's what you wanted, right? Well, yeah you're really useful to have around. <laughs> it made her happy that I paid enough attention to help her overcome a problem. Quite often I'll go by a little kid and tell their parents what a lovely little kid they have how nice they are. How, what do you think that does for mom and dad? Yeah, that's a good one. Why do I do something like that? It's fun. Okay? It's fun. 
also help other people to relieve their suffering. One of the problems with the kind of loving kindness that's being practiced by most people right now is it's all mental. And they're not particularly helpful to other people. They, they think about their own loving kindness and how, that, how good that is, but they're not practicing the loving kindness. They're just practicing a mental discipline. And I know about it. I did it for a few years. At one time, I did it for eight months. That kind of meditation. But I was never really satisfied with it. Loving kindness is holding a little, a little dog or a little cat and having a connection with them. Or, uh, well, I was in uh, Malaysia. Some a, a woman was pregnant, and she came to me and she asked if I would give her a blessing. Of course, I'll give you a a, a blessing. But I found out uh, some years ago that water holds memory. And it's been proved now. So what I did was I got some water and I held it in a, in a glass bottle and I was radiating loving kindness to her for five or 10 minutes and I said, here, now you take that. And every day I want you to pour a little bit out and massage your baby while you're practicing loving kindness. If you feel a little sick, then drink some. Some strange things started happening. Now, when this lady, she, when she had her baby, she didn't have any fear and anxiety. Her mind was very uplifted and happy. And I was in the hospital out, outside the the room and just making sure everything was okay and she had the baby with almost no pain I mean it was just sweet. that was it just popped out like it was easy so after after she had the baby I, I said okay I'm gonna leave so I, I went home the next day. I went to the hospital. I wanted to see the baby. And the mother started saying, she, the baby isn't crying. And she seems to be sleeping a lot. And I said, well, that's no problem. So I, I held the baby and I radiated loving kindness to the baby and then gave the baby back. About two weeks later, I went to visit the baby again. I wanted to see how much it had grown. And she said, the mother said, you know, this baby is really strange because the baby's sleeping all night. Wow. And you know when the baby was born? It was smiling. And the baby was in a, a little thing for babies to sleep in and saw me, looked up and went, <laughs> Wow, <laughs> the baby felt my energy. So after that, I had a lot of pregnant women around me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was at that center for a little over a year and there was, I, I call them my babies. They, they, there was 27 of them. 
and all of them were, were really happy. They, they got along. They, they, they weren't much trouble. They did all kinds of nice things. And then I left Malaysia and I didn't come back for, oh, I guess it was 15 years. And all of a sudden these little babies are grown people. Wow, boy, did that make me feel old. <laughs> that's that's the, the test of whether you're getting old or not, how big the kids are when you remember them that we're, that we're only that high. And I did all of that because it felt like the right thing to do. So when you get off retreat, if you want to explore some of the other uh, jhanas that you were in, you make a determination that I'm going to get into this jhana and stay in that jhana. And if you, your mind starts to go off and get quiet, you can 6R and just come back to that jhana. You went through all of the jhanas very quickly because I pushed you. You didn't know I was pushing you, but I was. So say you want to get in, you want to find out more about what's all the different things that happen while you're in the first jhana. So you make a determination, I'm not going to go any higher than the first jhana. and stay with that for a few days. Every time you sit, just for this sitting, I'm not going to go any higher than this jhana. And do that every, every time you want to do the sitting. And you can explore what the first jhana really is if you want to continue on and do it with the second jhana or third jhana or fourth jhana, it's up to you. You're in charge of yourself. Don't ask me what to do. Because I'll tell you to sit for six or seven hours a day. <laughs> but when you're walking from here to your car, what are you doing with your mind? Oh, hum. Thinking this, thinking that, planning this. Oh, I got to go do that. I got to do that. Well, you know what you're going to do. So you don't have to continually tell yourself over and over again. Why don't you radiate some loving kindness when you're walking? There's a practice that the Buddha did that sounds really simple, but it's really not. And every time he started to walk, he always walked with his right foot first. Tried that practice for a while. And it was surprising how many times I forgot about it. But what I did was I went back to where I started and then I made the determination I'm going to start with my right foot. <coughs> or every time you open a door, when you touch the doorknob, radiate some loving kindness. Or when you get up in the, and I, I would really love for you to get into the habit before you go to sleep at night, tell yourself that you're going to wake up smiling and happy. Get in the habit of doing that. And when, when you wake up that way, then keep it going. David has a, th a thing on his phone about this guy that was talking about what happens when you smile. 
it actually does change your mood and it makes you happy. Practice it. You know, it's okay for you to have fun. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to get into your pain and anxieties. That's your choice if you do it. The more you practice smiling, the more uplifted your mind becomes. The more uplifted your mind becomes, the better your mindfulness becomes. So this is an all the time practice. Just because you sit in meditation doesn't mean that you're a meditator. A true meditator is somebody that recognizes the hindrances when they come up in their daily life and they use six R's. And they let go of whatever that hindrance happens to be. So make it an all the time practice. Having equanimity, it, it's a great practice, having that balance of mind then you're not going to have so many emotional outbursts. You're not going to have so much fear and anxiety and worry. And you can do that if you want. That's up to you. But I'd rather be happy. <coughs> It just takes practice. Remember to do that. So every time you see a, a doorknob and you start reaching for it, make it a habit of radiating loving kindness to somebody around you. Now, don't look another person in the eye when you're radiating loving kindness because that can cause a lot of confusion and sometimes it can be a hassle. But you can certainly radiate loving kindness while you're looking around and radiate to everybody around you. It doesn't matter. If you look them directly in the eye, they can misread that especially for women, then that turns into more problems than you really want to deal with. Talking and I don't finish the sutta. Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> so let's share some merit. <coughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas and mighty powers share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad. Mm -hmm.